I'm here with Marty Sirius Malmi. He is the second ever developer for Bitcoin and worked directly with Satoshi Nakamoto to develop the Bitcoin websites and forums. Thank you so much for joining me today, Marty. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about his experience with Bitcoin and probably starting there, but spending most of the time talking about his current um, his current startup with ERA and what he's creating, which is an identity system called Iris. But first, let's talk just a little bit about Bitcoin. So how did you first stumble across it online? Well, yeah, um, I was kind of abandoning the um, political way of uh, making the world a better place. And um, I was thinking uh, grassroots influence um, like uh, developing technology would be a better way to do that. I was thinking uh, um, how to how to best empower the ind individual and uh, give us more liberty in our lives. Um, and I figured uh, we need all kinds of decentralized infrastructure and mm -hmm. m money would be one of the uh, first enablers of all kinds of decentralized systems. So we would need a decentralized monetary system. But okay. so far, there had been uh, no no successful decentralized systems. There were all kinds of um, shady internet money systems, <laughs> um, like e-gold and e-bullion, whatever. Okay. Um, but they would usually just uh, combine the wor worst of okay. both worlds. So does that, it kind of sounds like you intentionally set out looking to find something like Bitcoin before... Yeah. So you set out intentionally looking for it. It wasn't like a stumble across accident. Yeah. So okay. I was looking to the existing options, but the only one that seemed actually decentralized and a good solution was Bitcoin, which okay. had been published just a couple of months before. Yeah. And you had mentioned that you were abandoning sort of a political means for making lives better. Were you polit politically involved before that? I was no, not really involved, but I was uh, quite interested in uh, in uh, how we should organize the society, okay. politics, um, and ki uh, quite libertarian leaning. Okay, and so what disheartened you from going the route of being a political activist? Um, that's a good good question. I just uh, don't believe that people have the right to vote about other people's lives. Okay. So basically, an ethical, ethical thing. Okay. And so you came across Bitcoin, and how did you first, like, did you reach out to Satoshi? How did that work? Yeah, I sent uh, Satoshi an email. Okay. I didn't care too much about who he actually was. Yeah, yeah. Only years later, I started wondering who's this guy actually. <laughs> Is it his real name? Yeah. Um, and so, can you tell me a little bit about decentralization? Because I think that when lay people think about the internet and think about money systems, they still think it is somewhat decentralized. Um, so they think, well, I have choices of different banks to go to. Like, sure, the treasury might dictate what money looks like in a given country, but there are still different kinds of banking options. And then just as people interact online, I think they feel like the same way. Well, there's these different platforms I can choose from. I can choose from Facebook, Twitter, Google Hangouts or whatever. Um, so can you maybe paint a picture for what the difference between the current system is versus a decentralized system? Um, well, our monetary system is quite hierarchical. So on the top, there's central banks and mm -hmm. then there's commercial banks, which are regulated by by laws and uh, regulators, okay. um, and uh, it's it's not really a free market of money, which okay. which it should be. So um, so that's why that's why we have Bitcoin, which is not based on rules and um, regulators mm -hmm. and uh, central trusted parties, but yeah. it's a protocol. So I'm not familiar with what Finland's laws are regarding Bitcoin now, but I know that the U.S. government is coming in and trying to figure out how to regulate Bitcoin more. Um, is there any kind of regulation going on with that in Finland? And what are kind yeah. of your thoughts? Yeah, there is. So 
uh, the obvious places where the lawmakers and uh, regulators are going to crack down are the exchanges where, okay. where the legacy system meets, meets cryptocurrencies. Okay. And that's already happening. So they have all kinds of know your customer regulations, which are, which are coming even onto platforms like local bitcoins, which is a peer to peer trading site. Okay. So that's where they're going. Okay. And so are you concerned at all that that undoes the spirit of Bitcoin in the first place? No, it just um, makes it a bit more difficult or mm, less anonymous at least to transact between the legacy world and the crypto world. Okay. And have you been, I'm sure you've been following like a lot of the financial blacklisting movement that's been happening. Um, so services like Patreon or even credit card companies have been cracking down on um, people that they think are immoral, um, like members of the alt-right and saying, well, we're not going to allow you to be on this platform anymore. And mm. some people have been moving off of those platforms and, on, and onto Bitcoin. And yeah. so Bitcoin has been starting to get sort of smeared for being the place you go to do illegal things or to be like a person who promotes hate speech, something like that. Um, what is sort of your perspective on that? Well, I'm a libertarian, so, so, <laughs> and I believe in the free market and I want money to be free. And I believe in, uh, in free money and free speech. Yeah. Yeah, so... And, and it's, money is just a tool and uh, like any tool, it can be used for good and evil. It's not the tool at fault. Do you think that that will stunt adoption of cryptocurrencies in the long run? No, no, I don't think so. Okay. Cryptocurrencies are, they have, um, they have utility and that's why they are used. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as, you know, you had mentioned, okay, financially, this is a good place to start to try to build decentralized infrastructure. And now we know that you're moving beyond financial systems to create more distributed, um, decentralized sorts of technologies. So can you explain what IRIS is, what you're currently working on, and what the purpose of it is? Yeah, so IRIS is a social networking application that runs on its users' devices. So there's no corporate gatekeeper who decides who gets to have an account and what you're allowed to post and what shows up in your feed. Um, so it's and it's a lot more resilient against uh, authoritarian governments or natural disasters because all data is on your laptops and phones mm -hmm. and they communi com com communicate directly with each other. Yeah. Um, so for Iris, I've heard you describe it as a decentralized identity system before. Is yeah. there a difference between a social networking account and an identity? Yeah, I kind of pivoted there. Uh, it used to be just an identity and reputation system, but I noticed it was easy to add general purpose social messaging. Okay. And I saw there was a lot of demand for that for, uh, for the same reasons as uh, with, um, with uh, payment systems. Um, people getting banned, deplatformed from social media and social media could be counted out as, as kind of public services these days. And so could you explain what sets Iris apart from Facebook in terms of ability to deplatform? Yeah. So you cannot really be deplatformed on Iris. You can uh, anyone can create accounts at will. But only the people whose web of trust included or upvoted your account will see its posts. So what does upvoting in that system mean? Yeah, so someone gives a link, someone gives you a link to their, uh, their public key, essentially, or identifier on the network. And then you just uh, go there and say, I trust this identifier. Okay, so it's a way of, an upvote is supposed to represent that, for instance, I, Amber, think that this account really is Marty, so I upvote it to try to show that this is the right person. 
Yeah, well, that's one, one aspect. There's some um, verifications also. So you could verify that this public key belongs oh, okay. to Marty. Okay. And this, all these other attributes belong to the same identity. So it could be used for all kinds of identity verifications. Okay. You could uh, ask, for, ask your peers for verifications for your Bitcoin address or uh, okay. phone number or whatever. It could be used for online authentication. So what, um, what is the difference between a verification and an upvote? Yeah, so, so you only upvote people you trust, but you could, uh, you could um, there could be, for example, an official party or professional verifier that uh, com checks that um, this public key and this name actually belong to the same person. I'm sorry, I'm probably missing what you're saying, I'm not understanding the difference between an upvote and a verification. Are they the same in your system or different, two different things? No, they're different things. So verification just binds different attributes into an identity. So it just okay. says this email address, public key, uh, name, okay. uh, Bitcoin address, whatever attributes belong to the same identity. Okay. It could be a person or an organization. And that doesn't necessarily does not necessarily mean that you are trusting that identity. So trust is the upvote, where the upvote comes in. And what yeah. does it mean to trust somebody in the system? Um, remains to be seen how people are going to use it. Probably it just means you like someone or you dislike someone. Okay. And what is your hope for how people come to conceptualize trust? Uh, I mean, you could you could always um, use different semantics, like um, you could uh, say that uh, you could break it down into different components. I trust uh, these people in this area, but not in this other area. But in the end, I think people are anyway just going to use it like um, I like this guy or I don't dislike this guy. Is it just one upvote? per person or you had mentioned breaking it down into different attributes. So is it like you could say, I trust this person financially, I trust this person's character, um, like that type of a thing? Well, you could, you could do that, but it makes the user interface more complex. Maybe it could be used in different kinds of user interfaces while using the same, uh, same uh, Iris library in the background. Okay. So is it fair to say that an upvote might be closest to like a f following somebody on Twitter right now. Yeah, could be, and you could um, you could give different uh, different rating strengths. So currently, you can give uh, from one to three thumbs up or down. So you could or down. Okay. Yeah. And so, what is a down vote supposed to re represent? Just distrust. Uh, yeah, the effect is that you won't see their posts again. And uh, if mm. your web of trust downvoted someone heavily, you might want to hide them as well. So will you see how your web of trust upvotes or downvotes people, or is it solely based on your profile? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You'll see that. And uh, you can uh, configure the metric yourself. You can choose to uh, either hide or not hide the downvoted identities and what thresholds you want to have. So downvoting doesn't, so downvoting is really, you're creating a system of weights to see how many posts, it's sort of like a waiting for how likely or not likely you are to see their posts coming through to your profile. Mm. And is there a default setting, like your web of, of connections, their overall weighting of a given person in their upvotes and downvotes will naturally dictate what you see until you upvote or downvote? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, I, I still need to experiment on the exact metrics. Okay. And are you concerned that that could stunt, um, like cause, I've mentioned on this show in the past, like mob rule. Do, are, do you have any worries that that could lead to both negative social outliers and positive social outliers from having their voices heard? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, of course, I want to experiment with 
the parameters and make the system as uh, useful and as possible and a positive social force. Um, so it remains to be seen how people would use the, use the system. But uh, I don't think that people would give negative ratings to others lightly. When you go by your own name and face and mm -hmm. trusted identity, they're not like anonymous posts on an internet forum. So it should not make the current situation any worse. Currently, anyone can go online and smear someone. That's that's true. Um, and I guess you're saying like on I, I keep going to Twitter as as sort of a comparison example, but on Twitter, if I follow someone, I'm going to see their posts. If I don't follow someone, in order for me to see the post, either somebody that I do follow has to do something with them or mm. I have to go directly to that page, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so in your system, will I start to see, like, the upvote and downvote system That, um, that that allows me to rank um, sort of their weight, but will I be seeing posts of people that I don't know at all just because my friend group already knows them? Uh, of course, you can cust customize your feed any way you like. So you can choose to only see posts from your first degree contacts. But when you go to someone's profile page or you go look up someone that you haven't met before, mm -hmm. in that case, you would see all the um, ratings from your web of trust. So could you explain maybe what all of the default sort of settings are like? So when I first arrived to, in Iris, what does it feel like? What am I seeing? Um, first, you are seeing nothing. It's the same as Twitter. First, you need to add people that you follow, or in, in this case, people that you trust. Okay. So let's say I add my first 10 contacts that in real life are the 10 people I interact with the most. Then yeah. what's sort of the default setting after that? How many degrees out do I see? Um, that's still up to experimentation, but currently it shows uh, up to infinite degrees of trust. And uh, it doesn't actually care about the weight of, um, weight of the connection. So if it, there's mm -hmm. only one, one, uh, one positive rating up to someone um, of five degrees of separation, their post will still show up. But that can be customized by the user later on. Okay. So essentially, this is pushing sort of the censorship power down to each individual user, and it's up to them who they want yeah. to censor or not. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Okay. Um, because we that's my way of uh, avoiding spam and other unwanted content without giving power to central moderators. So I if, think that's a key issue here. If I downvote somebody three times, you said is the maximum, yeah. does three times mean I will never see any of their content? Yeah. Well, of course, you can customize that behavior as well. But by okay. default, I think that would make sense. And I'm assuming upvotes and downvotes are reversible over time? Yes. Okay. Yes, so I also want to encourage dispute resolution. I imagine people would usually give um, downvotes only in dispute situations. Um, well, yeah, actually the unfollow or hide dynamic might be a bit differ different mm -hmm. from, from this uh, dispute mechanism. Okay. But um, yeah, so I don't think people would give uh, negative ratings lightly, only in cases of disputes or even crimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope in those cases there could be maybe inbuilt dispute resolution features in the user interface. Okay. So you could pick someone, some trusted person to um, mediate or resolve the dispute. Okay. And give their judgment. <laughs> So how much traction do you anticipate Iris getting in the near future? It seems like people are frustrated with platforms like Facebook for being irresponsible with data and also for um, censorship to some degree, but nobody seems to leave them. 
Yeah, that's true, because there are no good alternatives. And um, I think there's an enormous potential. Uh, of course, I want the whole world to be on this decentralized social network, but I need to make it technically uh, technically good enough that that is possible. I feel like one of the biggest challenges with replacing social media platforms is less how user-friendly it is because quite honestly like Facebook and Twitter they're not intuitive it seems like they have a startup cost to figuring out hmm. um, I don't think they're technologically all that great I, I guess hmm. I should say user interface wise they're not all that great um, but they have they already have the network effects that yeah. are in place and so a lot of times when friends of mine say oh I've had it I'm leaving Facebook yeah, they come they back can. within a month because <laughs> yeah, they, every other alternative their friends aren't actually a part of. Yeah, and they want the party invites. Yeah, so do you have... And, and I mean, Bitcoin had the same problem, right? Because, you know, the Bitcoin itself is not valuable until enough people are on the network. Yes. Um, so how did Bitcoin overcome those network effects? And how do you expect Iris to? Yeah, well, Bitcoin started with some enthusiastic users who just believed in Bitcoin, um, selling something in exchange for Bitcoin. Um, like we pizza. <laughs> yeah, and we used to have a listing on Bitcoin org that listed all the services where I used to maintain the listing where you would have all the uh, stores or merchants uh, <laughs> accepting Bitcoin payments until it came, became unmanageable at some point because of too many. Yeah. And what about with Iris then? How do you, because you can't really create a <laughs> listing of here's all the people in the world who are using it. <laughs> yeah. So I have a way of overcoming the network effect, which is importing content from existing platforms. Okay. And um, that that can be done because of the message format that I'm using. Um, that means you can import content from Twitter, say, and uh, the message is cryptographically signed by the crawler, by the person or the um, script that imported mm -hmm. the message. It doesn't need the actual user's uh, digital signature. So I imagine that <laughs> I imagine that Twitter and Facebook and big companies like that don't like that idea very much um, yeah. because they want to kind of keep their monopoly on the data. How, how does, you know, I'm not as familiar with GDPR since I'm in the US. Is Finland, I'm assuming Finland is also a part of what's covered by the GDPR? Yeah, yeah it is. So does that give you sort of more confidence and coverage in being able to import data from those platforms? Yeah, well, that's true. I guess GDPR gives you the right to import your own content. But I'm not an expert on this. But uh, I don't really care what the, what the regulations say uh, in this regard. Because uh, I want to make it work uh, despite it. So you can all, well, at least always you can import your own messages. You should always have the copyright and legal rights to them. But um, I, don't, uh, I don't care if Facebook doesn't like someone importing all the messages they can find. <laughs> that's quite, I, I agree, but that's quite the statement, I think, for a lot of people to hear. Um, they, mu they might wonder, like, this is, this is just a platform. Hmm. So what is the big deal? I signed a certain terms of service. So why does it matter so much to own your own data? Hmm. Well, maybe um, I guess uh, some of the first users might be the disgruntled uh, people. The deplatformed people. Yeah. Well, deplatformed people especially, but also the disgruntled normals who don't like the social media companies and might want to go there as a protest. and. Mm -hmm. uh, when there's enough interesting content there that is not elsewhere, then uh, others will follow those, the ma majority who won't actually care about what they're using. Yeah. Are you 
confident that people who are being deplatformed from Facebook and Twitter and these various places will have content that other people want to chase? Because the argument could be made, well, these people are deplatformed because they're on the inappropriate, politically incorrect fringes of society, so why would somebody follow them? Well, many of them aren't. Um, you can get deplatformed for no good reason at all. Um, and uh, I, I believe in uh, free speech. It's not the company's job to judge what is, uh, what you can say and what you can't. Um, I believe that everyone can choose what they want to see and what they, what they want to follow on. Do you think that private companies like Facebook and Twitter have the right to dictate who's allowed to be on their platform? Yeah, well, I, I do believe that, but I think we should have better alternatives to those kinds of companies. Okay, so you agree that they have the right, you just think that the decision they're making is not wise in the long run? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, how much of the data that is going to be on Iris at some point, how much of that is really private data? Yeah, so currently all data is public. That's, it's easier to start that way and build okay. a private, private communications and group messaging later on. And what are your feelings about surveillance capitalism? Will Iris try to monetize by, monetize by mining data that comes onto the platform? Yeah, well, of course, if it's public data, someone's going to be mining it. Um, but you can make it more private and that way it's not visible to advertisers. Oh yeah, and ads are one reason why people might uh, move to Weed. Iris. <laughs> yeah. So are you suggesting then that Iris won't advertise directly, just that yeah. other people could mine yeah, other Yeah, you can entities? completely customize your feed and it's running your, on your own device. Um, so no one's going to decide what you're going to see. Although if I'm friends with somebody who likes, um, I don't know, let's say like Walmart, they, they friend Walmart, for instance, I know friend isn't quite the right language, but if I have my settings for two degrees out, would I start to see advertisements embedded because my friend likes the advertisements? Uh, you can always customize that and uh, maybe, maybe you, you would uh, want to filter out messages by uh, organizations, only get uh, like personal messaging. Mm -hmm. You can always customize your feed settings. Okay. So if this is just something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, as I've realized that the internet has really only figured out how to monetize on the basis of advertising or subscriptions. So what is the long-term if the, if the long-term business model for Iris is not to advertise, hmm. are you planning on making this a subscription service? No, not really, because I'm not really, a, I'm not building a service uh, or a platform. I'm building a protocol here and people are paying the costs themselves um, in uh, the cost of devices and networking and storage. Could you explain for non-technical viewers what you mean by a uh, platform versus a service versus a protocol? Yeah, so platform, something like Facebook that runs on their servers, they pay, pay the bills. Mm -hmm. um, in case of Iris, you buy your own devices and you pay for your own internet. Okay, and so how are you, how are you planning on having Iris's data, or I'm sorry, um, code like kept up with over the long term? Is the idea that you partner with some other aspects of Iris that maybe are paid, or I think it's, how does it work? It's kind of um, kind of a um, popular. I believe it would be a popular utility. Okay. Uh, so that um, volunteers would contribute to it, similarly to Bitcoin and other cryptos. Okay. Um, and so. When we talk about decentralization with money and with Iris as a sort of identity service, it seems like the main difference between centralized and decentralized is that the person who, in the case of Bitcoin, the person recording the ledger changes. 
hands a lot. And so there isn't sort of a dictatorship. In the case of Iris, each person acts as a platform for themselves. Um, and as you're saying, data is stored on your own device. It's not um, in a centralized server location. So when people talk about the decentralized web as being the future of the internet, I think that it's a little bit fuzzy to most people what that really means and what that really looks like. Um, I, uh, probably the closest thing that people think about is the Silicon Valley TV show. Do you watch mm. Silicon Valley, the TV yes, show? Yes, I do. It's great. Okay, so I think most people think, oh, Pied to Piper. But yeah. even that is a little bit hard to understand. I was actually just tracking down. Um, there's one episode where the protagonist, Richard, gets really frustrated that nobody understands his technology and then he goes on explaining it and it was actually a very clever way for the show writer to try to explain the decentralized web to lay people since the main topic of the show was itself kind of unclear and so it was sort of this comedic funny thing but in spite of that a lot of people don't watch that show and even in that show itself it's it makes fun of itself for being confusing um how would you try to conceptualize the decentralized web more broadly for um, the public? And well, let's just start with the explanation. Then after that, I want to know why that is so important and why you think it is the future. Hmm, that's, uh, that's a <laughs> tough one. I guess um, decentralized web means that the infrastructure is decentralized. So there's uh, protocols for synchronizing data between different storages like GAN um, and there's protocols for incentivizing this exchange, uh, this um, incentives for providing networking okay. and uh, storage. So GAN for those who don't know is um, a decentralized data synchronization protocol. It's basically like a database and it's how data gets moved from one device to another, right? Yeah. And um, each, each device that we're talking about, what kinds of devices are these? Are these servers? Are can, they... Can be all kinds of devices. It could be a laptop or a phone or it could be a server. Okay. And so contrast that with what does it look like in a, in a centralized setting now? Yeah. So in a centralized setting, uh, the data is uh, persisted on servers that are okay. run on running data centers, uh, controlled by corporations usually. Okay. So really, the decentralized web movement is about pushing power from big corporations down to us little people, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. And why is that important? <laughs> That's important because we don't want to centralize uh, too much power to these uh, corporations that are too big to fail. Um, we don't want to give them too much power over our, our lives that can be abused. Mm -hmm. I, when I talk about Iris, I am often get the um, people are asking, have you seen the Black Mirror episode? where? that dystopian episode where people are rating each other, giving stars to each other. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that episode. <laughs> oh, yeah. But... Um, and the stars are just like a, repu like a good citizen type of system, or...? Yeah, a bit like that, uh, which reminds me of the Chinese system, yeah. of course. <laughs> yeah. But the, um, the key point here is that we don't want a centralized operator to such a system. Uh, we don't want any government or corporation decide your trust score or credit score, social credit score. Um, instead, um, on Iris, um, when you look at someone's profile, the mm -hmm. trust score or the content you see always depends on your personal web of trust. So okay. it's subjective, depends on the viewer. Okay. So just to kind of push back again and trying to get at these broad stroke ideologies. You've said a number of times that you identify as libertarian pretty strongly. Um, and 
also that you see there are dangers in monopolies in the private sector, not just in the public sector. Mm. Um, so it, it sounds to me like uh, you're not necessarily neoliberal, which is kind of like, you know, people who have built themselves up into a monopoly, like whatever, they worked hard for it, they deserve it. It seems like mm. you're not of that persuasion. You're kind of in the middle where you think that there needs to be a check on the private sector, not just from the government and probably not at all from the government, but instead by other private sector parties? Yeah. I okay. be, believe in the free market. And I, I believe right now we need to develop alternatives to these companies that have become monopolies. Okay. Um, and what, which kind of tech monopolies do you think have been or will be the most problematic in having so much power? Like, are you concerned about Facebooks or are you concerned about Googles, you know? Hmm. Maybe um, lately it's been uh, like Facebook and Twitter, social media, that, that um, have been a hot topic. Um, all the political stuff going on, polarization, mm -hmm. um, and these alle allegations of uh, influence in uh, elections, all this kind of stuff, um, propaganda. And to what extent do you think that companies like Google have also uh, influenced the election? I think that's talked about less, but I know there was at least one documentary, I can't think of the name right now, um, but that, that had basically called into question whether or not Google search engine returns on various candidates were kind of fudging the order of search results that were fed back to an individual. Um, and that's also a subtle form of kind of manipulating public opinion, but yeah. you still feel that the social platforms are more problematic? Hmm. Well, both are problematic, but uh, I guess recently it's been social media. Who knows, maybe Google is doing something behind the scenes that is even more <laughs> dangerous, but uh, that's why we, we don't want to give them too much power. Yeah. It will always be abused. And so now that you've been on the front lines decentralizing money and then mm. decentralizing identity or, or social networking, for lack of better terms, um, what are some other big areas that you think are ripe for becoming decentralized? Well, I've, if I get uh, this social networking thing done, uh, I guess um, another interesting field would be energy, decentralized energy networks, mm. whereby uh, for example, houses could uh, trade electricity between each other and paying with cryptocurrency. So now that yeah. we have the cryptocurrency, we can decentralize, have decentralized markets for all kinds of utilities. Yeah, utilities at large. So yeah. if I could just magically bestow upon you the ability to decentralize all the things that you need to be decentralized, and we're now in this utopic future, what does it actually look like for the average person? What does it feel like? Hmm, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I guess uh, you would be uh, topping up your, your mobile phone, um, some cryptocurrency wallet and setting, for example, limits. Uh, I, I, uh, I can I'm willing to use uh, up to $100 for networking and uh, another $100 for electricity. And mm -hmm. then you just move from a place to another and your device will negotiate with the nearby uh, networks to get the best prices. So mm. maybe it might make the consumer's life a bit easier actually, because you don't need to have these credit relationships with your telecom or your um, energy company. Uh, you just uh, refill your cryptocurrency wallet and, mm. and it will be handled automatically. So a lot of this decentralized stuff, it is, I like the word you use, negotiating. And it, it seems like it, there is a lot of negotiation with like local devices and people and things and entities. Um, and it sounds really complicated for a lot of people. <laughs> So does yeah. it feel complicated or does it feel... No, I'm, I'm hoping it could be making things simpler because okay. you don't need this, uh, make the, enter into these contracts and credit relationships with companies that provide utilities. 
Mm -hmm. And so when I, do you think that it would lead to um, decentralized web? Do you think that it will lead to more small businesses and influencers as opposed to these large conglomerates like Facebook and Google? Or will it still have really popular entities? So for instance, Iris might become a really popular um, company that people use a lot, but Iris itself just has more checked power. Hmm, well, Iris is um, a protocol like Bitcoin, so it's, it's not really going to be a company. A company. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping and um, and I believe that uh, it will, will be more decentralized, more uh, like smaller businesses. But of course, you always have the advantages of scale. I guess there are still going to be big data centers that participate in these decentralized networks because they are they can store information more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Uh, like big power plants, nuclear plants that yeah. <laughs> join the decentralized network. Yeah. So I'm just trying to, I guess, get a clear picture of um, how these systems really work. Like right now on on Twitter, there are some people who have millions and millions of users, or I'm sorry, followers. I think like, I think Katy Perry has, I can't recall off the top of my head, but I think she's got the number one, she's got the most followers of everybody on Twitter and it's many millions of followers. But if you just think about it statistically, more than half of the people on Twitter have to be following more people than are being followed themselves. Hmm. Um, as, the, as people start to use protocols like Iris, do you think that that will largely stay the same? Or is it, or would you expect people like Katy Perry to have fewer followers and other people to get more followers? Hmm. I guess I believe that uh, social dynamic might uh, stay the same. It's okay. just the uh, underlying technology that is changing here. Okay. And so how do you, in conversations that we've had in the past, we've talked a little bit about the ability for IRIS and systems like IRIS to come in and help tease apart fake news. How does mm. that work? Yeah, so uh, you could filter all the content that you see on other platforms as well. Y you could be running the, um, the IRIS uh, browser extension and it would, um, uh, for example, it could uh, filter, it could check the URL that you're browsing and see um, records for that URL or for that domain. Just see, based on your web of trust? Yeah, and okay. see if that is uh, connected to your web of trust and what's, what kind of status it has. Do you anticipate, because um, in the US, politically, things are very... Um, just very politically polarized and tense. Yes. Will, when I hear things like webs of trust, it makes me feel like, ooh, this could lead to a lot of tribalism and mm. like group think where people really shift and become even more set in their ways and viewpoints as they're influenced sort of by their echo chamber. Is yeah. there a risk in that? Yeah, I think uh, there is that sort of a risk. Um, might be that Iris makes it even easier to form your own echo chamber. Um, I've heard that uh, already people are circulating list, like blacklists on Twitter of people with mm -hmm. opposing political views that they're gonna block before even uh, seeing them, their posts. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, Iris could make this even easier, but um, remains to be seen. And then again, um, I've, I've seen a research paper uh, related to ideological echo chambers on social media. Um, I cannot, uh, I don't uh, remember the abstract uh, completely, but um, it, uh, it suggested that these echo chambers might not be as bad as uh, we have thought. That hmm. 
uh, actually people are unable to have a real conversation with others who have opposed, completely opposing views. And people need to have something in common to have an actual discussion. Um, <laughs> Interesting. So, yeah. yeah. So the idea is that creating echo chambers might actually reduce polarization or at least emotional polarization? Yeah, at least you won't get as mad on social media. <laughs> <laughs> and what are your thoughts about that? Do you think that that's favorable or unfavorable to get in an echo chamber but not be mad? Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping it, it could have some positive impact. I don't know. Remains to be seen. And what about you, Marty, when you're on social media now, like Twitter and Facebook, um, do you create an echo chamber for yourself? Or do you try to have diversity well, views? Or what's kind of your personal policy? Well, kind of. Um, but recently I have uh, unfollowed even a lot of political commentators that I agree with because I don't want to see political stuff on Twitter. Uh, I don't re need reinforcement for my political views. <laughs> I want to see something interesting and new stuff like uh, technological developments or whatever. I want to hear something that I don't already know. <laughs> but yeah, I, I have sometimes uh, removed like um, half familiar people from Facebook whom I've met maybe once and they post something annoying and I <laughs> have sometimes unfriended them, I admit. Um, but on the other hand, I still have friends with opposing political views that I don't want to unfollow, even though they post their bullshit. <laughs> I don't want to see. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think that that, um, I guess for each, when, you're, when we're talking about, I guess this mechanic, now that I think about it, is the same for Facebook um, and a little bit for Twitter too. But in Iris, when we're talking about everything being based on a web of trust, when you unfriend one person that is of a particular political persuasion, you're also cutting off your ability to see all the people that they're friends with that you are not, all of their content as well. So it kind of creates an, an exponential feedback for who you're friending and unfriending mm -hmm. in terms of the content that you view, depending on your settings, I know. But yeah. Um, if we assume that you can see just like Facebook, like two hops out. So I see friends of my friends. Um, but when the network gets more dense and you have more users, you're going to be uh, most likely connected to everyone on the planet anyway, if there's enough users and enough data in the system. Yeah, that's true. And you will just see different weights on this. Uh, users. I'm trying to remember on Facebook, I think it's like three, everybody's separated by three and a half degrees on average, yeah. um, which is pretty wild because if in Iris you're setting that you can see three hops out, mm. that means you're theoretically saying you could see anybody around the globe who's on Iris's, pla on Iris, using Iris's protocol, yeah. you could see everything coming from everywhere which is an interesting mechanic for amplifying voices. Um, mm. I'm trying to remember what you had said earlier. I think you, I think you had said that right now you don't weight your seeing of a post on the basis of how many hops out they are in terms of friends. Is that right? No, actually, currently you can only filter by the distance in the web of trust. Oh, okay. Uh, but there's no trust score um, filtering yet. Okay. I guess that could make sense if everyone in the world is a third or fourth degree connection, uh, then you would rather have a um, trust score or some kind of other metric based filtering for your feed content. So you're saying you would see people who are further hops out but more trusted more yeah. than people who are f further hops out and less trusted? Yeah. Okay. And which elements do you think are personally more important, the trust or the hops out? Hmm. I guess, uh, I guess it's the trust that is more important. Um, if you have given a thumbs up to a friendly bus driver, it might mean less that uh, someone than someone who has gotten 100, 100 upvotes from mm -hmm. your friends. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I find interesting about 
iris in the trust score is that it seems to be coming from a completely different um, a completely different ontological perspective on things than than most systems and by that I mean it seems to it seems to suggest like that reality is shaped by the eye of the beholder more so than um, sort of this dualistic system where I can only see what I subjectively see and in reality there is this real thing going on so like the social China's social credit system there's there's only one score and it doesn't it doesn't differ right but in iris my trust score is going to be different for each person relative to what mm. web they're in and how they're related to me is that yeah. correct yeah that's correct so I want this to be kind of an extension of the human mind um, so there's this concept Dunbar's number, which is commonly estimated around 150, which means the number of people that you can uh, have a um, mental map of in mm -hmm. your mind or a, like a tribe of um, people that you can uh, e efficiently know and interact with. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping with information technology, we could grow this number to include the whole planet. So the whole world could <laughs> Be like a tribal society or a village society where everyone knows each other and therefore wants to treat each other better. Do you mean that like mentally I'm keeping everyone in mind or just like through Iris we have sort of numerical accounting for how we relate to people? Yeah, through okay. Iris we, you could uh, uh, have uh, everyone in the world in the same tribe with you. And uh, actually uh, there's this concept or this term uh, social scalability, which was coined by Nick Szabo, mm. who's one of the strongest candidates um, for Satoshi or the best guesses mm. who's Satoshi. Um, he wrote about social scalability in a famous blog post a couple of years ago. Um, but I wrote about Dunbar's number four years ago and Mr. Zabo is following, following me on Twitter, so I hope uh, I have been an influencer because the wording is very similar to my oh, very <laughs> cool. post there. So social scalability is the same thing as Dunbar's number or is well, it Well, social a bit scalability um, is an institution's um, ability to grow beyond the limitations of a human mind mm -hmm. or, the, or beyond Dunbar number. Yeah. So, for example, a Bitcoin could be an example uh, of a socially scalable system that can scale up to the whole world. Mm. Whereas you could argue that um, democratic lawmaking doesn't scale up to, or it gets worse as the community. Democratic lawmaking, is that what you said? Yes, democratic, uh, like parliamentary mm. process. Yeah. And could you explain that a bit more? Yeah, like... Uh, Democracy of uh, 10,000 people might work pretty well, but democracy of one uh, mm. hundred million or billion people, not so well. Yeah, you're like having to decide on a one-size-fits-all law or regulation. Is that what yeah, you mean? Okay. yeah, and the, also the decision-making process and all that. Hmm. Or uh, socialism. Socialism can work in a family very well, but uh, not so well in a country of hundred million people. Do you think that decentralization of the web could ever lead to decentralized lawmaking? Like I know hmm. libertarianism is sort of like that now. You're, you're trying to push um, <coughs> regulation making down to the lowest rungs of, of politics that you can. Hmm. Do you foresee any kind of lawmaking happening through a social web? Yeah, yeah, I hope so. I have actually re written a blog post about oh, uh, really? free market law. Um, that's quite a complex topic and uh, I'm not sure if I can articulate it well enough, so you should just read the blog post. But, but yeah, I, I, I think that law mon monopolies are as bad as any other. Um, and that's why we have this horribly inefficient um, uh, 
systems of law and justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, legal processes could take years and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and the end result might be unjust and people are put into this uh, prison industrial complex and um, taxpayers are paying $50,000 a year to yeah. jail someone when in a free market system, I believe they would be required to pay a compensation instead of uh, people putting them in a cage for a year. Mm -hmm. So are you on the on the political spectrum, you've talked about being a libertarian, are you, um, like to what degree, is that sort of the, just the best party you can really identify with right now? Or is that mm. really the ideal embodiment of what you would want? Yeah, well, I guess uh, libertarianism is a mindset of its own as uh, like any mm. political affiliations or leanings. Um, yeah, mm, you could say I'm a voluntarist or, well, it's voluntarist is better than anarcho-capitalist. Anarcho-capitalist is misunderstood easily. But mm. voluntarist, yeah, I, I believe all human interaction should be voluntary. So therefore things like taxation are, are not uh, ethical and not and even from util utilitarian standpoint are not um, not good. And so if you were um, able to change like taxation systems the way you wanted, what would that look like? Uh, well, I don't I don't think that taxation is any more justified uh, than mafia collecting their protection money. Right. Um, so I don't I don't believe in taxation. I think that all kinds of services should be organized on voluntary basis. So okay. you could uh, laws uh, or legal protection could be provided by uh, voluntary uh, organizations that you you choose to belong to. It could be a tribe or it could be a, an insurance company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever works best and uh, fits your preferences. Finland is, I'm assuming, has pretty high taxation rates, like all of Scandinavia mm. does, right? What is Finland's, like generally about what kind of percent of income well, is tax? Well, government spending is 55% of GDP. Part of that, wow. Is, that wow. part of that is borrowing, but that's eff effectively taxation uh, beforehand. Wow, that's, that's wild. So, yeah. When it comes time to pay taxes, are you just like <laughs> begrudgingly writing a check or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. That's, uh, you need to play by the rules. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you had just mentioned, now I'm going to lose my train of thought. There was something else I wanted to ask you. It was, uh, um, remind me, what were we just talking about before? taxation. Oh, okay. So what do you buy the argument that, well, if the government doesn't protect collect taxes to protect certain groups of people, like private organizations just won't step up to protect them or help them when they might need that help? Well, uh, if you believe that people are good, then uh, they would uh, do that without, uh, without any government. Actually, uh, reliance on government can cause people not to help others because they think it's the government's job. Um, and if you believe that people are evil, then you don't want democracy anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So I believe that people are good. That's interesting. So, yeah, that's fascinating. You're kind of suggesting that your ideological preferences come from this underlying assumption about human nature being intrinsically somewhat good, that people will help. Um, and that, that like socialism sort of rests upon this idea that people are not inherently good. And so somebody needs to come in and regulate. And I think mm. one of the things that's always kind of confused me about that socialist mindset is that, especially in the U.S. today, I don't know, I don't know about Finland um, and Finnish politics, but that people are trying to use 
the government and democracy to vote into these regulations. And it seems odd that people would elect into um, socialist regulations if they're not intrinsically good and willing to help privately in the first place. That's yeah. always kind of baffled me. And probably, hopefully my, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law don't watch this and kill me, but it was funny because um, this, this past Christmas, um, my husband and I were talking to our brother and sister-in-law about the stuff and we're both of totally different political persuasions and we realized that they're, they're very liberal and progressive and they're wonderful people and, and whatnot. But it was interesting because we realized that in their own personal lives, they are viciously capitalistic, but mm. they are, you know, voting in for higher taxes for certain regulations. And so they clearly have an interest in um, protecting people who are oppressed, but they personally, on a personal financial level, kind of game all of the systems and assume, I think, that everybody else is behaving that way as well, and therefore we need these regulations to be put in place. And it's mm. kind of this ironic flipping on its head, you know? Yeah, yeah, no. So have you always been libertarian in your preferences? Hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, I would say. I think it's, um, it's a certain uh, mindset, as, as are all political persuasions. Yeah. And are, are you, have you ever considered, you grew up in Finland, right? Yes. Have you ever considered leaving Finland to go somewhere else with fewer regulations? Well, yeah, I have. Um, these days it's the family and friends that keeps me in Finland. Oh, fat but, web. <laughs> but um, it's, it's not just the taxation that makes a country free or non-free. Um, if you take a look at economical freedom indexes, uh, Finland, Finland is, I think, still in the top 20. Okay. And uh, also things like um, rule of law or um, regulations about private property. Um, all kinds of things are affecting the economic freedom freedom rating. So what do you taxation. what goes into an economic freedom rating? Yeah. So I I guess um, there's many factors there um, in different indexes. Um, I think it's, of course, ta taxation, public spending is one. Then there's labor market freedom, whether mm. that's trade unions and everything, and uh, private property rights, uh, mm. like um, in China or African countries, you you might not have land, private land ownership or mm. such. So it's a lot of things besides just taxation. And what are some of the consistently top um, scoring countries? Hmm. I think um, Singapore and Hong Kong have been pretty high on the list. Okay. Um, although those countries don't have social liberties that much. Yeah, it's interesting because I was just in Singapore a couple months ago, and hmm. when I was talking to locals there, they were saying their taxes are really, really high. Oh. And at one point in the conversation, we had asked, like, do you like the government here? And we kept getting, like, yes responses. And then at mm. some point, somebody we asked said, well, and they kind of tipped us off to saying, I can't tell you how I really feel. And we, oh. and that was when we realized, oh, there, there, there's actually not as much um, freedom of speech there as we had expected. Mm. Um, and it, I guess it's interesting to me that a country like Singapore is – getting rated highly if they do have such high taxes and also can't really critically reflect on the government there. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the up-to-date ratings of these countries, but also um, I guess places like Switzerland, I guess United States is in the top 10. Okay, so we have it good here? <laughs> uh, in some senses, but I think uh, I think the uh, justice system and uh, Healthcare is horrible here. <laughs> yeah. But, but economic freedom, uh, standard of living. So, what, what does. Could we ever imagine a decentralized healthcare system? And if so, is that a desirable option? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think it would be just a system of uh, free agents 
um, like Uber for healthcare or whatever mm -hmm. that people could join. Um, and all these decentralized services are basically just decentralized indexes or I mean uh, uh, all the popular uh, services out there are just indexes like eBay or Amazon or mm -hmm. Uber or whatever. They're just lists of stuff and if you can decentralize decentralized lists of stuff on uh, the technological level that mm -hmm. opens doors to all kinds of uh, decentralized um, alternatives to these companies. And I believe um, Gun is doing an excellent job with that. Yay, that's great. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Gun is, um, for those who don't know, that's one of ERA's products. It's a, the peer-to-peer -peer data synchronization protocol we talked about earlier mm. and is really trying to be the backbone that powers the decentralized web. And um, yeah, and it, when we talk about the decentralized web, I think it's easy to lose sight of what we're really talking about is empowering specific individuals. Any individual can have power to be their own platform, mm. right? Yeah. So, I think also web of trust comes um, comes to play in this yeah. different decentralized applications because you need some way to limit spam and unwanted mm. content. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe web of trust is the way to do that without central moderators who mm -hmm. decide what listings are allowed and what is not. Mm -hmm. So turning back to Iris for a little bit, you had tweeted a while ago um, announcing that you were creating Iris and you had also tweeted, no, it's not running on blockchain. Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, so why, why not? Why not blockchain? So I don't actually get all the blockchain hype. It's totally disproportionate, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the buzz around blockchain. Because blockchain is great when you need strong consistency, when you need a shared ledger, for example, where everyone must have uh, the same version. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be convinced that your money can, when you get money, uh, it's actually yours and not sent to someone else double spent. So mm -hmm. you need to have um, the same status of the ledger. But besides that, in uh, uh, applications where strong consistency is not needed, you don't need a blockchain and you don't want a blockchain. Because mm -hmm. um, blockchain uh, uh, transaction rate, blockchain transactions are expensive and uh, mm the throughput is limited yeah so with uh, if you're building a decentralized social medium you should not be using blockchain you don't need you can do it with eventually consistent synchronization like gun does yeah so why do you think that people have latched on to blockchain as this hype thing mm, that's uh <laughs> that's a good good question um it sounds like emperor's new clothes <laughs> kind mm. of thing to me. Um, people, I, I don't really understand the mechanic be, behind these kinds of pipes. I guess, I guess it's that uh, everyone has incentives to participate in the hype, but no one has the incentive to downplay it. Mm. So journalists get get um, clickbait articles. Blockchain is gonna uh, change everything yeah. and um, VCs can market to their um, inv uh, investors and startups get funded and everyone benefits from the buzz. So I, I suppose this, you know, you're working on Iris, so that might be the answer to the question, but while everybody is distracted, for lack of a better word, by blockchain and maybe, and they probably are building out some really important applications where blockchain is a necessary component and is useful, but it seems like a lot of people are getting distracted by blockchain, building things that really don't need blockchain at all. Mm. So while all of that is happening, what, and, and is operating as a sort of distraction, what are people missing out on for the real direction that will improve the internet and economic growth in general? Like, what do you think is the next kind of innovative area to be exploring? Uh, in regard to decentralized web? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm assuming you 
are, you're biased. I'm asking you a biased question, I suppose, but it sounds like you think that the decentralized web is the next big thing, right? Yeah, and I hope so. Okay. And is there a specific niche inside the decentralized web that needs to be focused on first? Uh, and let's I, say yeah. Iris aside, because I'm assuming yeah. Iris is kind of what you think is the next most important thing. So if we build out Iris, hmm. I think often a lot of really important innovation comes when we say, okay, what's next? And then what's after that? And we start working on the what's after that piece. Um, hmm. So once Iris is in place, what's next for, in terms of infrastructure for the new web? Well, we could, uh, we could create easy tools with GUN and Iris so that people can start all kinds of decentralized uh, in, uh, indexing, decentralized listing okay. type services, uh, decentralized markets, marketplaces, okay. like so Uber like... for something but decentralized. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of lay people, and actually Mark and I talked about this in the first um, recording we ever did, hmm. but I think a lot of people mistake Uber as already being decentralized because it's a bunch of people who are independent contractors driving off in their own vehicles. Um, mm. Yeah, because it's decentralized on the user level, but not in the background. Yes. So what would be the benefits of decentralizing something like Uber? Why would we bother? Well, that's, um, that's um, the benefit there is easier to see than in social media because social media doesn't cost you anything. Mm. But uh, driving Uber, you need to pay a, a provision or a fee to the company, Uber. Okay. And you would save, I guess, I don't know what they charge, 10% or something. Okay. It's, it's an easy sell, <laughs> Okay. 10% more. Yeah, so you would just be cutting out the middle man transactor and yeah. then pushing the savings to the users of the platform. Yeah. Okay. And, um, and so we decentralize services like Uber, what are some other ones? Um, Airbnb, Rover, yeah. Yeah. eBay, <laughs> stuff like that. Amazon. <laughs> okay, and but you're uh, you're considering that to be indexing, like a, a list, or 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 am I confusing that with some other things that you consider to be important lists to put together? Yeah, I think that's that they are good examples. Okay, it's interesting how the data model uh, beneath is just a list. Yeah. Of stuff. Yeah. That you can order in different mm -hmm. uh, directions. What about um, companies that actually carry traditional capital? So, for instance, like Amazon, there's a, a, a tangible product, not just a service, that's involved. How might we go about decentralizing a service like Amazon? Hmm. Is it essentially um, just like eBay? Well, Amazon does a lot of stuff, but uh, Amazon as in a retail thing, um, like uh, merchants selling their stuff through Amazon can be decentralized. Okay, so it's pretty similar at mm -hmm. the end of the day to Uber, where these users might have their own cars, but you just cut Amazon out and you have decentralized Yeah, people goods selling exchange. their stuff directly, like Open Bazaar is actually already doing. I haven't tried it out, so I don't know how it works. Open Bazaar, that's the name of the, of the service? Yeah, peer-to-peer -peer okay. marketplace. Okay, marketplace. See, I need mm. to change all of my language to even match. <laughs> mm. Very cool. Well, um, can you just maybe give me your hope for the future and whether or not you feel confident and positively that all this stuff is going to come to fruition? Yeah, I want to see all kinds of infrastructure decentralized. Um, so if you want to, for example, Catalonia wants to be separated from Spain, mm. but they cannot do it. They, even they don't have the tools, even they have um, lots of people there. And I want, um, I want decentralization good enough that enables uh, individuals to, to um, leave the government. I don't know how to say it in English. They actually have a site called Eroa Valtiosta that's uh, resigned your government <laughs> membership. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I want to enable that. 
Very on the cool. individual level using these uh, decentralized alternatives to everything that governments are providing. And I'm, uh, I want to be positive and look to a brighter future. And I'm actually optimistic on the long term, although in the short term, uh, with the polarization and everything, it, it's kind of murky sometimes. Mm -hmm. Marty, so my understanding is that you're not um, very involved with Bitcoin anymore. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I basically left the project in um, 2011, around the same time when Satoshi left. But I'm not Satoshi. <laughs> <laughs> so what, why did you leave? I felt like uh, Bitcoin was, had already gone from zero to one, to use Peter Thiel's mm -hmm. analogy. Um, it already had tons of great developers working on it. And I could uh, move on to something else. Okay. And you felt like you were just going to be better use elsewhere? Yeah. Okay. And things like Iris or okay. something like that. Yeah. So what, um, in 2011, that's still very early, when did uh, cryptocurrencies like Ethereum and other things come along? What year was that? Hmm. Not sure about Ethereum. I think uh, Bitcoin had another boom in uh, late 2013, okay. 2014. I guess that's when the first um, mining chips and the mining farms started mm. appearing. Ethereum, was it maybe 2015 or something? Okay, so some of these other coins didn't come around until after you'd already left. Yeah, I guess Litecoin might have been the first uh, Bitcoin fork. Mm. Uh, and it was there pretty early, maybe like 2011 or something. Okay. But altcoins really started booming later, like 2015 and later. So what were your thoughts as these new coins emerged? Like what was kind of going through your head as, as cryptocurrency started to become more popular? Yeah. Um, I believe in the free market of money as well. So I... In, in principle, I think it's good that we have other options. Mm -hmm. But it might just be that money uh, is a natural monopoly that converges to one protocol, one system that everyone mm -hmm. is using. <clears throat> and that, that's how it usually happens in isolated environments like uh, prisons, where um, one commodity ends up being the currency. Like a like cigarette. Cigarette, cigarettes yeah. or cans of tuna or whatever they have there. Mm -hmm. So it just might be that Bitcoin is going to be the, the market leader. Is that what you anticipate? Yeah, I think okay. so. And it's, well, Bitcoin has um, around 50% market dominance at the moment. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, 50% of the total market cap mm -hmm. of cryptos. And Bitcoin has by far the most active developer community and best security yeah. and um, adoption rates and actual use, not just speculation. There are quite few, quite, quite few um, cryptos that are actually used for commerce, actually, besides Bitcoin. Do you think that Bitcoin is, technologically speaking, the best option that's out there? Hmm, yeah. Yeah, so far, I, I think so. And is that just from a personal bias, or do you really think that that's kind of the objective reality? Well, I haven't seen anything better, really. There are some uh, uh, more privacy-oriented coins, mm -hmm. like Monero or Zcash, mm. but they're not uh, necessarily technically better or scaling well enough. So maybe things like Lightning Network could improve the privacy of Bitcoin or whatever future technologies come up, it might be that they would be integrated into Bitcoin if they are technically viable. And how do you feel about um, proof of work versus proof of stake? Uh, that's a good question as well. Um, I think uh, proof of work uh, has a better track record. Mm. I mean, we haven't seen too many successful proof of stake systems. And it can be argued that proof of stake uh, might lead to more centralization of mm -hmm. power into the people who hold, hold it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, time will tell, but 
but uh, so far it's been proof of work, I think. And could you just briefly define for viewers who might not be familiar with language like proof of work and proof of stake, what each of those are? So in proof of work, um, the ledger status is voted on by computing power. So the version, the uh, transaction history that is backed up by the most computing power is considered as the right one okay. that is shared by everyone. Uh, that's how you achieve consensus without a trusted party. Um, that was the big invention behind Bitcoin. And uh, in a proof of stake system, um, instead the consensus is achieved by voting. So holders of that coin would vote mm. for the next uh, block of transactions to be okay. appended. So what are, I, I've sat in on a couple of lectures on um, blockchain technologies at Stanford and um, people kind of get worked up about proof of work's effect on the environment. <laughs> um, yeah. What's, what is kind of your response to people who would be like, but it's not green? Mm, yeah, of course you can argue that the banking system that we are trying to replace also consumes a ton of resources, um, and especially with uh, cars, drive, trucks driving around with cash money <laughs> and everything and hitting the <laughs> bank offices and whatever. Um, <laughs> That's but, pretty funny. I've never... But, yeah heard that response before yeah. to that kind of a concern. Do you have any sense for um, like how the energy consumption for proof of work systems like Bitcoin compares to driving physical currencies around and it's, whatnot? It's hard to really estimate the power consumption of the Bitcoin network. Um, I've seen some estimates that say that the banking sector um, consumes 10 times more than Bitcoin, but they're just guesstimations. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. But still, it would be preferable to have um, a monetary system that is uh, less resource intensive, where mm -hmm. you don't need a ton of electricity. But then on the other hand, you can always use renewables. You can always make use of the excess heat. Uh, you could move mining into places where heating is needed, uh, mm -hmm. like Finland. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you could use the data centers for district heating or heat up uh, greenhouses or whatever to mm. use, make use of the excess energy. Interesting. Um, how, do you, how do you feel about utility tokens? Utility tokens, um, I don't really see them being used um, it's quite difficult. Um, I'm not quite difficult for the user to have mm -hmm. a wallet full of diff different utility tokens. Um, and I don't see what, what they bring to the table really. Um, why not use just Bitcoin and Lightning Network? Because, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, utility, to utility tokens, um, I feel like they're usually more for fundraising and speculation. Mm -hmm. more like pyramid schemes. Mm. And what about, so I just, a couple of videos ago, I interviewed um, Dan Finlay, who is a co-founder of MetaMask. Um, mm. And he kind of had almost the opposite take on things, saying that he foresees a future um, in which each person kind of has their own their own coin or token hmm. and that trust kind of akin to um, what we were talking about earlier in your upvote downvote system, that hmm. that might represent the stake that you hold and trust for another person and that each person might kind of issue their own currency. Um, and hmm. that, I mean, I guess that, that kind of is at odds with what you just said and also is at odds with um, your statement earlier about how currencies might kind of tend towards monopolies. Hmm. It, do you have any kind of further reactions to his thoughts on where well, currencies I might go? We might see um, 
um, trust-based money systems like like Stellar, which is a popular crypto mm. system consensus network already, which is maintained between trusted parties um, and uh, thereby institutions or people set uh, credit credit limits to each other, mm. uh, which which are used to route payments between users. But even there, uh, that doesn't mean that everyone has their own currency. It's denominated in some other currency, whether USD or cryptocurrency. Mm. So could you tell me a little bit more about Stellar? I, I am not familiar with Stellar and I've heard cryptocurrency is often described as um, being a trustless system of exchange. And then for Stellar, you were using the word like trusted others. It, is it sort of an opposite approach to trustlessness? Yeah, yeah, kind of. There, the consensus is maintained between a network of trusted uh, parties. Um, also, there is Ripple, um, which is kind of similar, but Stellar has, in my opinion, a better and more decentralized uh, consensus system. Mm. Um, so in Stellar, you don't need to spend a ton of electricity to maintain the system, and uh, it can support a far greater transaction volume at a lower cost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with all of these kind of dizzying arrays of cryptocurrencies, for people who aren't very familiar with cryptocurrencies, um, I should say aren't familiar with like the intricate details of them, but who generally think, oh, wow, okay, this kind of is the future direction that economics would go. What mm. would you suggest to them for what to look out for when they're choosing what currencies to invest in? Hmm. Well, I don't want to uh, give investment advice. I, can, uh, I think the ethical thing is to tell about your own investments. So you have skin in the game. Um, have you I, invested in, do you own currencies right now? Yeah, I have like 95% Bitcoin <laughs> and then small amounts of Stellar and uh, Ethereum and I guess that's mostly it. But um, one future development that could be foreseen is, um, is the integration between different kinds of payment networks. So mm. money would uh, seamlessly flow between the fiat currencies and the cryptocurrencies um, and the automated networks would find the best exchange rates and routes um, and people could store their assets in whatever form they want mm -hmm. so you could choose to only hold, hold bitcoin or dogecoin or whatever you trust in or maybe gold backed by someone if you're a gold bug um, and then when you go to Starbucks and buy coffee, the network would automatically convert it to whatever the merchant wants mm. using the best exchange rate. And I think this is a very good, uh, would be a very good development because it would uh, add increased uh, com competition between currencies. Are wallets, are cryptocurrency wallets already doing that or not yet? I don't think there are quite that advanced features. There used to be and maybe there still are some uh, credit cards uh, that are linked to a crypto wallet, but they could be mm -hmm. worked on. This is one of fe the, one of Stellar's features mm. is exactly this kind of routing between different assets. Mm. Um, you're mentioning credit cards, like cryptocurrency credit cards, it makes me think about um, some of these bigger companies like Visa, Mastercard. I know that they've mm. been approached on a number of occasions to try to create some sort of a debit card, at least, that people could use cryptocurrencies with. And they haven't wanted to try to integrate with cryptocurrencies. And I think one kind of big reason is that it's like cryptocurrencies get around the double spend problem. So taking out credit is kind of hard in the first place. But why do you think they are resisting cryptocurrencies? Maybe they see it as direct competition to them. Uh, but um, I guess that, that could be circumnavigated by 
just adding crypto support, support to the payment terminals uh, on the hardware level. So is it possible to even run on credit with a cryptocurrency or not? Because my understanding is you're not taking out credit, but maybe there is some like tricky way that you could have a relationship with an entity that would let you take out and use their own cryptocurrency ahead of time and then mm. collect in fiat later. Of course, uh, if you have a credit relationship with someone, it can be denominated in cryptos. And on Stellar, for example, you could do quite easily do these kinds of things. You can give credit, um, credit limits to anyone. Okay. And it will be routed through the network. Yeah. Um, if a bank is... If, if, if a credit card company like Visa and MasterCard does adopt cryptocurrency, at what level is it... Like I had mentioned before that people have said things like um, Bitcoin is the cryptocurrency or is the currency of the alt-right and stuff like that. Um, to what degree do companies like Visa and MasterCard lose their ability to financially blacklist? Um, if they have, my thinking is that if they have regulations in place in a government saying you need to know who your users are mm -hmm. and a company like MasterCard and Visa did start to integrate with cryptocurrencies because they know who these people are and because of, um, are you familiar with the phrase idioms of use that people have talked about? Like you could figure out who a wallet holder is just by, um, certain assumptions about how Bitcoin typically is transacted and you could figure out identities by backtracking. And mm. so theoretically companies like Visa and MasterCard would be able to tell with pretty high accuracy how people are using Bitcoin um, to make purchases and theoretically still blacklist them, right? So mm. I guess this is a my question is changing as I'm as I'm talking out loud, but mm. Bitcoin wasn't really intended to be private necessarily. Um, mm. To what degree do you think that was an oversight by Satoshi versus a feature? Um, I think that's more of a technical limitation. So far, it would just uh, be quite difficult to do do. Um, untraceable uh, digital currency. Um, so mm. you like to push power to people and you like freedom of speech. It seems like Bitcoin not being private kind of breaks with a lot of that ideological mm, preference. No, I don't think so because you're still decentralizing the creation of, of money and you don't need to ask anyone's permission to transact. It's just that uh, transaction will be visible to everyone, but even uh, that can be addressed with Lightning Network or something. Some layer so what does the Lightning Network do exactly then to mask how you're using your currency? Yeah, so on Lightning Network, you can open these payment uh, channels between people. So you commit, for example, one Bitcoin to a um, payment channel. And within that channel, you can make an unlimited number of transactions, mm. basically for free. Is that like so the, the crypto mixing where you kind of scramble who owns which Bitcoin? Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Mm. Um, but also on Lightning Network, you can chain these channels and route payments through these channels. So if I have a payment channel with you and you have a payment channel with your husband, I can pay him mm. uh, through Lightning Network. Oh, without Without having entering. a direct, direct channel to him. Or I could have a payment channel to a bank or a or big organization, and then I could use that to pay for my coffee. So is Lightning layered on top of Bitcoin or is Lightning a separate currency altogether I'm not it's layer on top of Bitcoin okay so I don't understand I guess how you have a direct payment channel is it so you only you need to only 
open and close the channel on the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain. But then all the transactions inside the channel are done outside the blockchain and not registered publicly. Oh, okay. So they're grouped together and then sent to the blockchain for like one record at a time of all of those? Like uh, it's only chunking you, the transactions? Only when you want to close the channel. Um, okay. You need to commit it to the blockchain, the status. Okay. And you're saying that just by sending that bunch of transactions in one go sort of gets around the privacy issue that's inherent in... Well, I mean, because the transactions are carried out outside of the blockchain. So um, you might not even need to close your pay lightning payment channel. Oh, okay. You just leave it open and let the balance shift. Does the money, I mean, it until it enters the blockchain, doesn't it not get committed to a given person? Like, let's say you paid me through the Lightning Network. Can't I not mm. use that Bitcoin until it is committed? Um, yes, yes, that is right. You cannot uh, move it uh, forward, but um, you can route it through the Bitcoin through the Lightning Network to someone else. Okay, so I could continue. You send it to me, I could send it to someone else, and there's sort of the promise of committing it to the blockchain at some point, potentially, but it never actually has to leave in order to change hands. Yeah. Is that the idea? So how much kind of um, shady business is done on the Lightning Network? Uh, Lightning Network is still uh, in development. And it's quite difficult to use. Um, you need to be pretty technically <laughs> oriented to do that stuff. Um, but so, it seems like the fringes of society are the ones who are willing to get into the technical nitty gritty, right? Yeah, it's it's not uh, really, as far as I know, <laughs> might be changing all the time. But as far as I know, it's not too much in production use yet. Okay. So I guess I'm thinking like Bitcoin had this reputation for being where you go to buy drugs and do shady business and stuff like that, but um, it's not private. And so it, I guess I'm... It's, it's kind of semi-private. It can be tracked if you put enough resources into it, but if you buy contraband stuff for $100, no one's going to bother, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, part, part of the reason, though, that we're not bothering with $100 right now is because it's not the dominant currency. I, I guess I'm just trying to understand how it is any different from, like, when I use fiat, ca when I use cash, cold mm. hard cash to buy something, right? Like, there's the ongoing joke. I know people used to say, like, oh, only drug dealers use Bitcoin. And it was like, well, yeah, and you're not going to use a credit card to buy drugs. You're going to use cash because it's not easily tracked, but it's theoretically traceable. The cash is theoretically traceable. Mm -hmm. um, so why, if Bitcoin is no more private than, let's say, using physical cash, why, other than the issuance of money and being decentralized and kind of, stabilizing inflation so that it tempers that and the government's reach on like controlling the value of a given Bitcoin. Why, um, like, is it decentralized in any way? I mean, it does, how, mm. how valuable is that for, um, excuse me, for freedom of financial transactions? I think it is, it is still pretty important and decentralized because of the money creation is decentralized and you don't need to ask for anyone's permission to move your own money which can be frustrating when working with banks well i mean i so i, I agree with that <coughs> on obviously there's a lot of value in the creation of money being decentralized um yes. and yes it is frustrating when you want to move your money and the bank is like well wait three days until this transaction posts that's mm. annoying um but still like the government is only regulating cryptocurrencies more and more. Mm. And um, I think right now it's most closely being treated as a commodity, at least Bitcoin. And so when you 
purchase Bitcoin and then later spend Bitcoin, you have to declare like what capital gains you had, if any, and kind of like treat it like gold. Um, mm. And so the government does start to regulate. And because they're having the know your user policy that comes into effect as well, it just seems like, yeah, I, I, I can appreciate what you're saying about the government not being able to control the flow of it. But practically speaking, how much really changes when you have to report to the government what happened in that transaction after the fact anyway, because they might not be able to stop you from making the purchase, but three days later, they could do something about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I get what you're saying. Um, but um, I still don't think um, that monitoring of Bitcoin is practical on such a grand scale that you could um, track all transactions and uh, connect them to real life identities. Is there some sort of a systemic reason for that that I'm missing? Because I think we could say the same thing about cash, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just too complex. You cannot really track. Um, it's not practical to track every um, physical note out there. Yeah, so you're saying because you know, people do under the table deals with cash anyway, that's it's too costly to it's the same tracking. Yeah. Okay. So it's not necessarily got ease of use advantages other than when you're waiting for a transaction to post or um or I should say, and the fact that it doesn't, like the government doesn't issue the money, right? Yeah. Okay. I think it's interesting that, um, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that you don't see privacy as more of a bug in Bitcoin. And mm -hmm. I also think it's really surprising that you think that Bitcoin will or I shouldn't say Bitcoin, but one of the currencies, one of the cryptocurrencies will kind of dominate as a natural monopoly. Mm. And you seem to be okay with that. Um, both yeah. those things just surprise me for somebody from your ideological flavor. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't think the monopoly is a problem if it's, um, if it occurs like voluntaristically, uh, not enforced by any regulations. And if the monopoly, well, actually it's, I'm not sure if we can say monopoly. It's, it's like saying that um, English language has a monopoly in America. It's a shared protocol. It's not enforced. And I think it's, it's not a problem. There's no central uh, uh, party that governs the English language or the Bitcoin protocol. Um, I don't know. That's, that's interesting. Like, I, ha I have to think through that some more um, because I think that people would often, like in the same way that you're not okay with democratically chosen regulations, um, one could argue like, well, English language was a democratically chosen protocol no, I think it, that's um, that's a different issue. Uh, like languages are more organic; they are not top-down dictated. Um, it's emergent, unlike laws written by governments or central bank policies. I want I want to agree, but I think that I have to push back a little bit because it's not like laws come from thin air. Um, they are, it's sort of this cycle, right? Because the people try to push for certain laws mm. in, in a democratic system, right? People try to push for certain laws. Then this body comes in and inter in, intervenes and says, yes, you will, you will now all people, even those who didn't vote for it, abide by this law. Mm. But the people still are, it's a feedback system, you know? Um, I think maybe what you're saying is, okay, well, in the example of English language, 
maybe the organic piece comes in because instead of it being a feedback loop, this person can say, oh, hey, well, I'm not going to speak English, so I'm going to go to this retailer that speaks the language I prefer. Um, yeah. And that that doesn't get punished. But there is still an organic feedback loop of that retailer is going to slowly, <clears throat> excuse me, go out of business if the proportion of people who speak English keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, yeah, but that is still not top down dictated and uh, uh, that is not uh, removed from, uh, from the implications or consequences of reality. Um, unlike lawmaking, the voters don't really carry the costs of the policies and laws that they are pushing for. And that's why the system is broken. All right, Marty, I think that makes sense. I think that you've won me over to that perspective about organic systems being um, different than democratically dictated regulations. Um, yes, top down versus uh, grassroots. Yeah, yeah. So uh, in prior conversations with you, you'd mentioned prediction markets in cryptocurrencies, and it sounded like it would be potentially interesting. Can you tell me a bit about prediction markets? Yeah, so talking about the blockchain hype, actually uh, one of the few useful applications of blockchain, I think, would be prediction markets, um, of which there are uh, already examples on Ethereum, like Augur. So prediction market, that's an old concept that is already existing outside the crypto world. It just means you are making a bet on um, an outcome of, of some uh, verifiable mm. event, like who's going to win the presidential election or mm. um, how much the climate is going to warm up mm. next year, next decade. Um, and thereby you have skin in the game in the, 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 in the predictions. So does a person forward their money to a third party as they make the prediction instead of holding it until they see the outcome? Yeah, so um, what blockchain brings to the table is getting rid of the middleman here, the trusted party who takes mm. money from both, both uh, people who make the bet and uh, judges whether the bet was realized uh, one way or another. Uh, so how? So with how? <laughs> blockchain, both parties are committing their funds to a smart contract, typically an Ethereum smart contract. And then there will be a uh, kind of an oracle system um, where, where uh, a pool of judges uh, will decide whether the event took place or not. Mm. So, well, the oracle problem is still kind of um, kind of um, place for development there. Um, how to optimize the oracle system? But uh, but the blockchain uh, system, the decentralized system, enables people to start make predictions on all kinds of things. Um, so you could use it as an insurance, for example. You could mm. uh, make a bet that my house is going to burn down by accident mm. next year. And um, if it happens, then you get a compensation. Well, maybe that's not the best example because you have an incentive to, <laughs> to burn, burn down, it down. Your <laughs> house and it's difficult to well, then you could have some uh, trusted party to investigate the, the event, but maybe a, like a flight insurance would be a easier. So example. could you explain um, exactly what a smart contract is for everyone? Um, so a smart contract is a um, piece of code uh, in the blockchain that has um, where typically money goes in and conditionally money goes out. So a simple example of a smart contract and also one of the few useful use cases of blockchain, in mm -hmm. my opinion, 
is escrow. Mm. So, so uh, when you buy something on, online, mm -hmm. uh, you're committing the money to an escrow. So you're not sending it directly to the merchant. Um, but there, when, um, when you get the product, you, you can release the money to the merchant. And when there's a dispute, the escrow can resolve it. It's interesting. I mean, you, you had mentioned like there's room for improvement in the Oracle situation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it, how is escrow different from a third party? Like a... Um, it's different because the escrow in a smart contract cannot steal the money. They don't hold the money. They mm -hmm. can just decide who gets it later. Okay. And typically, I'm assuming the escrow party has some sort of a financial incentive to do that. Yeah, they would, I guess they would be, um, they would have a rep reputation to protect. So people want to use their services. Maybe they would take a small fee for doing the escrow. Okay. And does that have traditionally any biasing effects on how they choose outcomes? Because it seems like when they're operating, whenever they're mediating between a dispute, somebody's going to be unhappy. So with each dispute that they settle, they stand to have one positive and one negative review. Um, hmm. So how, when they're getting paid, is there, I'm not sure where that fee is coming from, but does that make them favor one party over another? Hmm, that's a good question that we would need to research. Okay. Um, there's um, the most uh, popular peer-to-peer -peer crypto marketplace is local bitcoins, but that, but then there is a more decentralized alternative called HODL HODL. <laughs> That's a Bitcoin meme, um, which uses this kind of an escrow system, if I'm right. And that would be a place to look into. Um, are there, like, do you foresee any ethical issues with these prediction markets? Yeah, well, it's been speculated that this could be used unethically, like um, for assassination markets. Uh, <laughs> so people could make a bet that uh, the president of the United States is not going to die tomorrow. I bet one million dollars on that. And then uh, when someone makes that happen, they get rich. Mm, okay. So it, it could incentivize, the, the act of placing a bet incentivizes behaviors themselves? Yes. Okay. But then again, the Oracle system could, um, Oracle system be, could be maybe built so that um, clearly unethical bets would not, not, uh, <laughs> would not be paid out. Yeah. Interesting. Has there been any, um, like on the record reports of this kind of thing happening? No, as far as I know, not so far. Okay. So I'm, I'm wondering if that, if the prediction markets are, have the potential for unethical behavior any more than what already exists. Like, it, you know, um, spouses that kill each other for the insurance payout, the life insurance payout and stuff like that. It seems like that issue is already, already yeah. at hand. Yeah, you have a point there, I guess. <laughs> so is, are, is the fear that just these prediction markets are going to grow in general? So like people are more likely to place bets or what? Well, it enables you to place any kinds of bets. I guess that's, that's the thing here. Yeah. But um, someone said on Twitter, which I retweeted that prediction markets could be a social force that uh, counteracts polarization hmm. because it brings back skin in the game and it makes people think twice before they actually say something. So if you actually believe in something, you need to be honest to yourself um, mm. because you are you risk to lose lose money if if you are wrong. So like what would be an example? Um, well, if you think that climate change is a hoax, you could uh, 
make a bet that the climate is not going to get warmer during the next five years. Mm. And you really need to be honest <laughs> to yourself when you're making a bet like that. And you would make a bet to a specific other or how... Like, I'm assuming a person would have to say, I, Amber, bet you, Marty, that climate change is real or fake or whatever, right? Uh, actually, um, Augur, the, I guess the most advanced uh, prediction market platform on Ethereum, uh, it's, an, it's a market, so you can sell those bets on. If you change your mind later, you can sell your bet on the market. And actually, you can see <laughs> the market valuations of different bets. So you can look at the market valuation, whether climate change is going to occur during the next five years. You can, you wow. can conclude something from that. Yeah. So that, that piece there that a bet could appreciate or depreciate in value, that's something I hadn't thought about when we first started talking about this that I could see as being kind of an an ethical dilemma because yeah like what especially so oracle type situations or or escrow people they're supposed to kind of call the shots on what what was a legitimate win and what was not a legitimate win but yeah. with a prediction market type situation especially for broader bets like climate change that seems like the type of thing where politics could really be swayed one way or another based on based on the valuation of certain bets and who stands to gain from those bets. So that seems mm. prone to lobbying. And <sighs> politics today, like, you know, if you're, if you're a climate change person, like climate change is real. And if you're a climate change denier, climate change is really not real. I'm not sure how you could get a, a board of people or an entity that could fairly evaluate something as having been a legitimate win versus not. Um, when it's strung out for so long. So like climate change, um, there was that paper, that scientific paper that came out that was saying, what was it, like 30 years they thought before the effects were going to be irreversible and we're all doomed, right? Mm. Um, so it, let's say somebody places a bet over the course of 30 years, how do you determine what was unfairly swayed or not by a pattern of politicians making decisions one little bit at a time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense. Um, so the predictions or the bets need to be clearly defined. Um, and Augur has its own uh, Oracle uh, system. So they have, um, I don't know all the specifics, but they have some kind of uh, rep token token called rep from reputation or whatever and I'm, I'm not sure how that's relevant but um, so all the token holders are incentivized to vote on outcomes of these bets hmm. and uh, if you vote the same as everyone else then you gain money and if you vote it otherwise you you stand to lose money lose the rep tokens so interesting it will um, well, we so have then to see how that how that dynamic is going to play out. If the rep tokens are um, diversified or enough um, <laughs> uh, spread around the globe, so to say, there's collusion between them to uh, game the system. Is yeah, why not as likely? Why would you ever vote not the same way other people are voting? I'm assuming if you go against typically, if you take the outside bet and it pans out you gain more than people who all voted in the same direction so you're saying it with the rep tokens if like the amount of rep tokens you have depends upon how you vote relative to other people yeah that's true but then again what keeps the collective to stay in the correct outcomes uh, is um, the whole value of the system if uh, people if the collective starts, uh, we're to start making uh, in, incorrect, validating incorrect outcomes, they, the token value would degrade. Okay. So the rep tokens are with respect to bets inside the system, or the rep tokens are with respect to 
actual judged outcomes of various bets? Um, I don't know the specifics of the system okay. actually. Okay. But they they have some they have thought out some kind of an incentive structure that uh, they hope to keep the oracle honest. Hmm. So what kind ha, have you ever placed a bet using these prediction markets? No, not really. I tried it out maybe years ago when it was not technically uh, good mm -hmm. enough for that. Mm -hmm. That would be interesting. I get, guess it's getting there. They, they got a lot of funding during the ICO craze. <laughs> yeah. What is your um, biggest concern about the crypto space right now that you think needs to be addressed? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, well, keep to the essentials. Uh, beware of altcoins. Mm. Uh, you could say I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Yeah. So I believe Bitcoin will continue uh, to be the dominant cryptocurrency. Okay. And altcoins are anything besides Bitcoin or is there a certain class that... Yeah, generally altcoins are anything else than Bitcoin. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much, Marty. I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you.